ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of the Daniel Hendrick Experience. Oh my goodness, it's been a nice vacation, and I'm super glad that you're here, and super glad to have on this special guest today, mezzo-soprano Emily Weinberg, hailing from the San Diego area. And Emily is an artist to watch for sure. The past year has been an exciting period in her budding career, amassing wins and prestigious competitions, including the Musical Merit Foundation of San Diego, the La Jolla Symphony and Chorus Young Artist Competition, and the Metropolitan Opera La Fonce Competition. And also recently, Emily made her debut at the San Diego Opera in Madame Butterfly as Kate Pinkerton, and also de debuted the title role of Carmen uh, with the Pacific Lyric Opera Association. So really excited for you guys to hear this young lady. Uh, part of our up-and-coming series of young opera singers that are taking the world by storm. So without any further ado, I'm so glad that you're back. Oh, by the way, also I wanted to remind you folks to go to danielhendrick.com. There you can find the link to the podcast. And also on YouTube, the Daniel Hendrick Experience, and you could see the video version. And for those of you who have not read the book yet, also go to danielhendrick.com and pick up a copy of my book. It's called No, You Know which details my story of having an opera career, losing my voice, and getting it back and singing all over the world. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's bring in this amazing mezzo-soprano, Emily Weinberg. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as advertised, the mezzo-sensation I was telling you about is with us right now. Emily Weinberg, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much for having me. So where are you right now? I am currently sitting in beautiful Carlsbad. Uh, I see very little clouds in the sky. It's sunny as all get out, and I am loving Southern California the longer that I'm here. <laughs> okay, Southern California. For those of you around the world who don't know where Carlsbad is, it's just north of San Diego, I don't know, 30 miles mm -hmm. or so. So, Anyhow, super glad that you're here, young lady. Um, I told everybody about you before uh, you, you were here on the intro and about the beauty and bigness and fullness of your sound. And that's not a common thing these days. It seems like uh, most of the singers are these super thin, light voices, but yours is kind of old school. How did that come to happen? Did you just have that natural or what the heck? <laughs> uh, well, for the most part, I started out a lot like many other people. Of I didn't start singing until... Well, I sang for fun starting very early on, probably around second grade, but uh, I didn't start taking lessons until right before I started high school. Mm. Uh, you know that very well because I started learning with you. Um, I had the pleasure of taking lessons with Daniel for 13 years, for those who are not familiar <laughs> with wow. uh, our history, um, but I... I feel very much like I got lucky with the right place, right time, right teacher. And I swear I'm not just saying that because it's you that I'm talking to. <laughs> <laughs> um, Did you grow up singing in the church or in school or? Synagogue for the most part, actually. Uh, okay. And then starting off with choir, just kind of on a whim. Uh, I actually initially was in orchestra for five years and then switched over to choir uh, because I decided that I enjoyed it more. I really did not like practicing the violin and I gained so much respect for string players. <laughs> mm. Wow. Okay. And did you find uh, singing in the, the Jewish temple or synagogue, did you find the music similar to the operatic vibe uh, the way you had to use your voice for that or was it very not different? Not even close. 
<clears throat> not even close. No, and to be fair, most of it was uh, youth choir materials, and I, I find Jewish music on its own just has a very unique feel to it. It's it's the specific way that the chromaticism is set up, or that the uh, the composer just happens to arrange a set of chords so that it just evokes that little bit of extra spirituality or joy, or I guess in some cases guilt. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it definitely has a unique vibe. That being said, the cantor that I had at my synagogue learned with you as well, and she had a beautiful operatic voice, and that was part of what interested me in the world of classical music. Mm, excellent. And what did your family think about you trying to uh, embrace this opera career stuff? I got incredibly lucky. Both of my parents have been supportive from the very beginning, which I recognize is not the case for so many people. But I, again, I got very lucky. My mother actually uh, majored in music education. She plays the flute. Uh, mm. And my father has always been involved in the arts one way or another. It's just kind of been a, a weird amalgamation of most people in my family having different sets of talent in the arts. My father's a writer, my mother's a musician, my aunt is a painter, my grandmother was a sculptor, that sort of thing. Oh my God, so it's really in your DNA. Mm -hmm. But I am the first singer in the family. Wow, how wonderful. And I read and heard from the community that you just made your debut in Madame Butterfly. What was that all about? And what did you sing? So that was my... Um, my first solo bit part with San Diego Opera. Mm -hmm. uh, I had actually, I had a very small duet in Soar Angelica the, the season before, but this was my first time singing alone on the stage all by myself. <laughs> um, and honestly, it was fantastic. I got to play Kate Pinkerton and delving into a character that has what can be considered to be virtually no information given about them. <laughs> right. It was a very interesting process because it gave me the opportunity to collaborate with uh, the conductor on a different level and the director and my, my uh, sorry, my, my Pinkerton, um, and just be able to, to speak to everyone and kind of get their, their different sets of input and create this character from what was what felt like nothing. Got it. Yeah. That's, uh, I've done that role several times that's uh mm -hmm. kate is not real uh not prominent in the yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay well that's cool and uh like last year you did uh your first carmen right yes yeah so that was uh october 22 actually oh my god that's almost two years ago uh Yes, so I had the opportunity to play Carmen with the Pacific Lyric Association in San Diego, and we did a, a weekend in Escondido as well. And it was an absolutely incredible experience. That is very much my dream role of, she is such an incredible character, one of the more independent, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Kind of wild. Uh, women in opera and normally a lot of the situations you'll have women who are in high society they have to behave themselves a certain right. way I know Carmen does what she wants when she wants with who she wants and it was so much fun getting to explore that character in the musical sense in addition to being able to play that role really I felt like it brought me out of my shell in sense yes it did indeed uh huh. Yeah, but when you're just used to uh, basically standing on stage and singing, and then you have to mm -hmm. embrace somebody that is so <laughs> sensual and moves on stage and is constantly mm -hmm. flirting with everybody, uh, demonstratively sexual, right? That mm -hmm. is her character. Maybe smoking a cigarette on stage. Who knows if you guys did that? But that's the type of character she was. You know, many years ago, um, there's a poster about it in here somewhere. I think it was 1996. I did sang Carmen in a bull ring in Querétaro, Mexico, with a real bullfight. Really? Without a microphone. 
Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to ask, the bullfight, was that at the end of the show as per <clears throat> most of the storytelling, or was this during? It was at the end of the second act. There you go. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. And, and it became kind of a, not necessarily did it fit into the opera, but it was a show. It was mm -hmm. a part of the show. And well, it then, makes me it makes me think of the um, the Metropolitan Opera production of Carmen, which toward the end, where Don Jose is coming on and he's uh, crying about how she's dead, and you have the final uh, lead out from the opera. What they've done in the past is have their rotating stage show that there is a bullfight going on on the other side. Not so bad, kind of right? That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll never forget that performance because at the very end of the opera. It started raining on us. <laughs> so we actually couldn't even finish it because all of the musicians were outside as well. So we had oh, to no. prematurely end the opera. So, And it was also sure, funny because sure. then they, they didn't want to pay us in dollars like the contract said. They wanted to pay mm -hmm. us in pesos. And all of the singers rebelled and said, no, we're not going on unless we get dollars. So somehow, miraculously, they found it. <laughs> Shocker. Yeah. But anyhow... That's wonderful. So, did you have growing up uh, a singer, uh, perhaps a mezzo that you said, man, I want to sing like that person? Or was it just a group of peeps? I, I never really found that one mezzo soprano that I, I guess I would have idealized. Um, not because there aren't mezzos out there that I believe are worth idealizing. Believe me, there right, are phenomenal right. mezzo sopranos I have had the pleasure of listening to and working with a couple of them, and it's incredible. But it was hammered into me very early on that I should not try to sound like anyone else. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I internalized that on a mental level as well of I'm just going to go forward and do my thing, and I'm going to take lessons from all of these wonderful professional singers that I have the opportunity to be around and to observe, mm -hmm. and just kind of make it into a compilation of me. That's good. Very good. So, speaking of the mental side, mm -hmm. have you found that there is a battle going on within yourself when you know you have a big performance or something that's big on the line? Is there like mental tricks you have or how do you deal with that stuff? <laughs> Very good question. Um, typically, what I've noticed is that if there's an important performance coming up, which you know, they're, they're all performance, or, sorry, they're all important. But if there's something that I feel like um, as, as a young singer, my, my reputation is on the line because some people out there don't know who I am, um, and I have to be able to, you know, keep up that <clears throat> level of professionalism, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how common this is for so many other people, but I will definitely start having performance anxiety-related dreams about between a week to a month out, depending upon how big the performance is. Uh -huh. So before Madame Butterfly, I started dreaming in the music, starting about a month out. <laughs> like, I know I know my lines. I know I know my choreography. It's going to be fine. But uh, no. And then you, you, know, you wake up, you go over everything in your head of, you know, this isn't logical. This isn't logical. There's no way that they wouldn't cue me to go on stage. And plus, I know all of my music very well. And you just have to kind of remind yourself that you have done this about a million times before. And the next time is going to be no different. There it is. Yeah, there it is. So <clears throat> years ago, when I was singing all the time, I used to have a reoccurring dream that I was making my Metropolitan Opera debut in Turindal. Mm -hmm. And I walk out on stage, I feel the ambience of the people, and I start singing, oh, what a beautiful morning. <laughs> and I keep singing it, and the conductor's looking at me like, what the hell are you doing? And I, don't, I can't figure out in the moment what's wrong. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So I know what you mean about having those dreams. It's crazy what what will come to you in your subconscious as you're processing it. You have a little bit of anxiety about something. Like you said, oh, maybe I'm not cued to go on stage. And mm -hmm. well, guess what? That does happen. Yes, or you I know. Actually, I think I think I did have someone miss giving <clears throat> me a cue. But you know, that's that's why you learn your music so well. That's why you have to exactly. be able to rely upon yourself. And mm -hmm. I, again, not to say that anyone who's working backstage is not reliable, but mistakes happen on every side. Okay. Singers forget lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so do you have a trick? Have you ever forgot your line? Do you have a trick on how to get the line back and get going again? Not in the moment. Um, there has been, I think I'm lucky enough that the last time that this happened to me that I was in college, of I went in, I believe it was to my juries during my junior year. I was uh, trying to get approved for my, my senior recital, I believe. And I went in and I had, I believe it was Peter uh, is of the, uh, from Faust. And something about the lines that morning, I knew them, they were memorized prior, but I ended up repeating the first verse in the second verse, at least for the first half of it. And then the second half, I had realized what I was doing in the moment. It's like, okay, okay, okay. What are the next words? Just get the next phrase right. Mm -hmm. So if, like, if you're in the middle of messing up a phrase, most likely you're not going to be able to fix it because of the different rhythms, the different uh, values for each syllable for depending upon yes. the aria. Um, but I feel like all you can do is work on knowing your music well enough that you can just jump in with the next correct line. That's a good one. I always tell my students out there that are doing the opera thing that when you forget something and you can't grab it, don't try to look for it because then that creates panic. Instead, just try to relax and hear the music, hear the voices around you, and it will come to you. But if you panic, because I've done that, and mm -hmm. it didn't give me the, the notes, and then I don't remember who it was that taught me that principle along the road, but... It was, it made a big difference because then now your subconscious is a little more relaxed and you're not in a panic mode like, oh shit, I forgot the words. Where do I go? Mm -hmm. And I can't believe, um, folks, I have a cold out there in case you, you're noticing. Uh, this is a pretty low version of my voice here. So anyhow, there's the psychology of this, one of the many psychology things, you know. Mm -hmm. Or you have Absolutely. a famous reviewer in the audience and you're like, oh, my God, I got to <laughs> do this right. Don't even think that way. Yeah. Not good to process. Absolutely. In actually thinking, thinking about it for a moment in regards to the um, forgetting lyrics or forgetting something or other, what I noticed helped me the most actually was when I switched over from just learning sounds and syllables as more of a beginner to learning word for word translation. Because the longer there that you, you spend with the language, the more work that you do in it, it's a lot easier to understand, okay, this means this. And it's not just because I have to look it up. It's because I've used this word so many times. Right. Right. And if you know the English translation at that point, then you can just kind of piece it all together. <laughs> wow. And when you, you were younger, did you study Hebrew as well? Never okay. as a conversational language. <laughs> oh, okay, no, but you study the structure. I can learn how to read this to do my bat mitzvah. Uh, but yes, if you give me Hebrew and it's got all of the vowels in it, which for those who are not familiar, Hebrew without the vowels just doesn't have the little dots and dashes. And for those of us who are not fluent speakers, it is very difficult to understand. <laughs> wow, okay. Yeah, I can read it, but I can't translate what I'm saying. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, there's a history in the in the opera world of guys, I don't know if you've ever heard of Richard Tucker uh, mm -hmm. and other singers of that era were famous of starting out in the synagogue too and crossing over into the opera world. You know one too, uh, Elliot from your own synagogue went on to be an opera singer too. And mm -hmm. uh I trained him as a tenor, and somehow he ended up a bass. I don't know how that happened, but <laughs> he, <laughs> he sounds he sounds great doing it. That's for sure. So, um, but anyhow, fascinating music, and when they take out kind of that old school traditional 
Hebrew stuff, mm-hmm. man, it's uh, it's a challenge. It can get intense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely, and like I said earlier, that's that's part of what interested and in, interested me in going into classical music was hearing my cantor with this beautiful, rich, round soprano voice singing this incredibly moving music, which I, a lot of the, the more classical stuff that she broke out was always very emotional, very, um, it was always an experience of even though I didn't necessarily know what she was saying, I still felt moved. Right. There's the key, right? And are you talking about Cantalori or some? I am okay. indeed talking about Cantalori <laughs> Frank from Temple of Dot Shalom. She is mm-hmm. a treasure. <laughs> yes. Wow. Okay, very good. So out there today in the stardom of mezzos, do you have a favorite one that you uh, you like to listen to, or is that also dispersed between all of them? Very much dispersed between all of them, and I think it's also partially because of the difference in uh, styles for uh, what I'm looking at. Because I'll be looking at anything from uh, Verter from, by Massenet to... Uh, Rossini to starting to explore Verdi to uh, Brahms. Everyone has their own different specialties. So True. for uh, oh goodness, which one was it? Uh, Jesse Norman is my favorite. Listen for Brahms, always. Mm. I, I love her interpretation, especially the uh, set of two songs for mezzo, piano, and viola. Just mm-hmm. gorgeous. Uh, I love listening to Joyce Di Donato. I love listening to Marilyn Horn. Julia Bartoli, uh, all all the big names. Honestly, I find that listening to a bunch of different interpretations by all of these incredible artists allows me to kind of, again, create an amalgamation that I feel is accurate of how I would want to communicate mm-hmm. that piece of art. That's awesome. You you find your own identity as just influenced, not copying. That's great. Very very good. So. Where do you see yourself like five years from now? What would you like to... Well, no, before we go to that one, mm-hmm. do you find that one language is easier for you than another language, or does it all feel like it fits in the same space technically? Singing-wise, that used to be... I hated singing in French. I despised it. Okay. And then I was given uh, the trio from Beatrice and Benedict as my first opera scene in school. And somewhere along the way, between doing that and L'Enfant et les Sortilèges by Ravel, my senior year, I believe it was, I learned to love it. And I've never had any any issues with German or Italian or anything else along those lines. But the, the three classic languages French was the one that I absolutely hated. And then I ended up performing Carmen. And somewhere somewhere along the way, it just became much more enjoyable and I could take advantage of the luscious feel of that language when paired mm. with this beautiful music. In regards to languages that are, in my opinion, difficult across the board for most people, Russian is on that list. <laughs> that being said, I also have come to enjoy yes. seeing that as well. So Pauline Zaria is one of my favorites. Wow. All right, young lady, if you don't mind, I would like to have the folks out there listening to you sing. Can you introduce this for us? Absolutely. So uh, this is going to be V du Vars from Der Rosen Cavalier by Richard Strauss, uh, which for those who aren't familiar, it's the opening aria to the entire opera and has become another one of my favorites. Excellent. Here we go.
Beautiful. Thank you very much. Sounds so easy too. Okay, if you don't mind, I want to ask. Yeah, I want to ask you a couple of technical things, if I may. Absolutely. Uh, to get your official position on the air. I hear you when you're singing this. Your throat sounds really relaxed. Mm -hmm. Do you think about that a lot? Or is it just happened as of repetitions? Or is it natural? Where did that come from? How did you get in a to performance? That? Sorry, <laughs> in a in a performance setting like that, it definitely isn't something that I can actively think about. Um, I've I've just noticed for myself over the years that once I get on stage, thinking about the technical aspect of things is typically only useful in an emergency situation, mm -hmm. or if if I can feel myself getting sick and things just aren't working right then I'll focus on that a little bit more. But aside from that, my goal is to just be able to lose myself in the character stepping on stage. So uh, to, to answer your question, that is definitely something that I work on on a regular basis. And especially considering the fact that I had to, um, I, I had a, a bit of a medical issue several years ago where um, we, were, we were coming out of lockdown and something was going on with my voice that just was not working right. Uh, my mental health was not the best at the time. And so not being able to recognize that I kept pushing and pushing and pushing and it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Mm. And after a while, like the, the uh, default position was just for my lungs to be way up here. <laughs> uh, when that, what ended up happening wow. is I had a, uh, cyst on the back wall of my nasal pharynx. Mm. Um, sorry, am I frozen? I look frozen on the side. You are frozen. Okay. Would you like to wait until that? Yeah, happens? let's just pause a moment. Let's see if you come back. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're having a little uh, internet issue with Emily. So while we're waiting for her to come back on, I'm going to play for you a recording of her called Il Padre Adorato. Oh, <laughs> 
Love it. Bravo. So what I was referring to before is I can hear that your throat mm -hmm. is uncommonly in a very relaxed position and your mm -hmm. jaw is relaxed and I hear your body underneath it more mm -hmm. than just maybe four or five years ago. So uh, was that something that you cognitively were working on in your practice with your various teachers and... Uh, Very much I, so, yeah. I think you've been working but, with Enrique from San Diego State, right? Mm -hmm. Enrique Toral, who is actually the new head of the voice department there. So Okay. That's cool. <laughs> he's, he's doing some great work, honestly. Um, so yeah, that was, that was very much a conscious thing that I had to work on um, coming out of some, some difficulties that I had coming out of pandemic as well, um, where basically my larynx ended up in, wow. <laughs> in my mouth. Um, it was definitely a very difficult thing to come back from almost losing my voice completely. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am thrilled that I had uh, the right person to help guide me out of that and get back toward some of what Good. I was already familiar to, which thank you very much for uh, helping me really relearn how to sing. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, coming coming out of that, there was, there was very much a, a time of life where I didn't really know what was going to come out of my mouth and having my larynx be so high and so tight and have so much tension mm. all over my entire being definitely did not help that uh, in any case. And so once I learned to relax, not just my larynx, but my the rest of my body and especially my mind, mm -hmm. things started falling into place in a more consistent way. Excellent. So now back to the question I wanted to ask you before, and then I had another thought. So 10 years from now, what do you see yourself doing? Like what kind of roles, where? That's that's kind of a difficult question for me to answer, not because I don't have uh, dream roles or anything along those lines, but the philosophy that I've developed over the last, let's say, decade, once I started thinking about this, is if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's that's not to dodge the question of, I, I would love another shot at uh, Dorabella. I had the pleasure of singing that in college, but on a, in a professional setting, I love the ins and, out of, uh, ins and outs of Così Fan Tutte. Strauss has been feeling really wonderful in my voice. I would love to be able to expand upon mm. that. Verdi is something that I would love to just be able to grow into, and I, I feel like that's it. starting to become I more of a thing. It. Um, so I, I have these roles that I would love to be able to sing. I don't know where I'm going to be though. And to me, that's both a, I don't really quite know how to answer that question when anyone asks me in addition to all paths are open in my opinion. You know, I've never heard that answer from somebody and I've asked that to a lot of people. That's pretty cool. That's interesting. Yeah, so I like I like having the mentality of I can just kind of do anything that comes my way. That is pretty damn cool. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Um I guess within that, if you had an opportunity mm -hmm. to go and sing in the major opera houses in Europe, you would mm -hmm. jump on that as well. Just mm -hmm. whatever door opens, <laughs> you go. If it fits Absolutely. within your voice, of course. Very much so. Excellent. Well, young lady, folks, this woman, you, she's going to be a star in the opera world. I guarantee that. <laughs> I'm taking bets at on danielhendrick.com. Uh, I'll be able to make some money on her by betting. On Do her I get success. any action on that if you win? No, you don't. Sorry. Bummer. <laughs> <laughs> but you get all the recognition. So there you go. Fair. Okay. You know what? Fair enough. <laughs> <Yes>. <clears throat> Anyhow, I just want to thank you for being on the show today and sharing your incredible voice. You're on the right track. Keep going. Uh, like Barbara Streisand said in Funny Girl, don't tell me not to live, just sit and butter. You go for it <laughs> and be you. And you are being you. And I'm super proud of you. Oh, and we've got to tell everybody about your hobby that I found that is so interesting oh, as well. Okay. <laughs> so not only is she an up and coming opera star, but she's also a really amazing baker. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess to expand upon that, my business, because being being a singer and making your income purely from that these days is virtually impossible. Right. Uh, so during uh, the short version of this is during pandemic, I was bored like many people. I started baking um, and I had moved back in with my parents and my father at one point just started calling me the baking mezzo for funsies. And it ended up sticking, sticking. and my business is called the baking mezzo and uh my uh, people people always ask me like what my specialty is what my favorite thing to make is i love to make cakes of all kind i love to experiment with new flavors uh if a client is able to give me just a flavor profile i can experiment and make something new and decoration is just such a fun part of that process uh, I'm very lucky that I was able to contribute to the weddings of a couple of my friends and help to make their day incredibly special and create something beautiful for them. And it's it's just been so much fun. Um, I thoroughly enjoy personalizing for breweries, actually. I'm a regular vendor at Battle Mage Brewing, first Wednesday of every month for trivia night. Uh, and I make specialty things to go with whatever they've got on tap. And do you have a website for that? I do indeed. It's called thebakingmezzo.com. Oh, that's easy. Ladies and gentlemen, you want a cake <laughs> and you're in Southern California, thebakingmezzo.com. Excellent. Emily. And I do deliveries. <laughs> I, I love you. I'm so proud of you. Uh, couldn't be prouder of you. You're doing it. Uh, you're focused. It's going to happen. I clearly see it. And when I know something, I know it. <laughs> I wrote a book about it, ladies and gentlemen. It's called Know You Know, and it chronicles my life's journey of being an opera singer, losing my voice, getting it back, and then eight years later making my debut in Lincoln Center in the mm -hmm. opera Mephistopheles with the great Mark Delavan. So, folks, go to my website, danielhendrick.com, and check it out, pick up a copy, and go to Emily's website and pick up a cake or two. She delivers. <laughs> oh, so until... uh, sorry. Additionally, sorry. Musical yes. website, emilyweinbergmezzo.com. Yes. Emilyweinbergmezzo.com. Check her out. <laughs> she is spectacular. And until next week, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for being with us on the Daniel Hendrick Experience. You guys rock. I love you all. Thank you for all of the emails and texts that I'm getting about the show and for subscribing and helping to support the show. You guys are the best. Love you. Until next time, I won't have a cold. See you then. Take a breath.